So today we're going to chapter three, basic reactivity. And um, the learning objective for this chapter is to go in depth on how the input and output arguments work, and also differentiate between imperative and declarative programming. Then we'll describe the basics of reactive reactivity and um, how input directly connects to output, and also apply reactive expressions to eliminate um, duplicated uh, work. So for the, uh, so let's, get to 3.1 or well, let me just kind of like um, explain each of talk a little bit on the um, objectives point on the objective um, for the input and outputs we've talked about input I think last week Trevin took us through that and um, we saw how the shiny widgets how we could um, use them how we could use them during it for in a shiny hub and um, today we we'll actually will talk we'll delve deeper on the server side and we'll go through how things work in the server side and the difference between imperative and declarative programming. So first of all, let's talk about what we've been doing so far. I guess this is not our first time using the R programming language. We've been using it for a while. And um, while we use R, we, we tend to do more of imperative programming. But in Shiny, it's more declarative where we tell the computer what we would want to do, then later it gets to do it. Then normally during a data analysis workflow, we just um, load the data, transform it, then visualize, voila, we communicate what we've, we've gotten so far. And um, for Shiny, it's kind of a different ball game this time around. What we're trying to do this time is to, is to create like, the recipe of what we want to, um, let me see what we want to cook. And Shiny goes ahead and makes what we want to cook as the um, clients or the um, the clients would want it to be. So um, for the UI object, or let me see, the front end side in Shiny, it contains the HTML. And this is what is presented to every user of the app. So everybody or every user gets the same HTML. But the back end side, this is where the difference comes in. At the back end side, it is it's it gets more complicated because every user can any user coming on that platform can do something different. You could be trying to check something totally different from what the other person is doing. And this really brings I think when I was going through this chapter, I came to understand that um it's more about creating a way to communicate your your maybe your data analysis um, result or output to an audience and possibly that audience wants it in a dynamic format and so shiny kind of like makes it possible for any user coming to that platform to do whatever he or she wants to do and get a particular feedback or whatever part of the um, um, analysis or say the outputs they are interested in they can just go there and find out more about it instead of just being get, getting a static report that's is fixed or just says something's literally fixed. And um, the backend side, like I said, is the, is the server object side and it's more complicated. And each time it's run, create a new environment for each run. So each time you're trying to create a new environment, giving each session um, a unique state. So we could have different user do, um, running, doing different things on the, on the app. And please, if I'm too fast, just you can stop me. And if you have anything you want to add, you want to say something, you can actually just do the same. You can stop me and you can interject and let me know. So um, a deeper dive into the server function. In the server function, we have about three arguments, the input, the output, and the session. Although we'll delve deeper into the session part in subsequent chapter. And um, how exactly does the, what exactly is the input part made of? It's a list-like object used for receiving input from the, from the browser. And um, we know that each time a client is reacting with something in the, um, the UI side, you could, it could be told, um, hi, what is your name? And it's trying to impute his name. Whatever gets into that, that, um, that impute widget gets delivered to the output side, to the server side. And that comes in as the output. But sorry, that comes in the impute. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking them, uh, mixing them up right now. So whatever gets into the input, um, input widget gets into the, um, the server side and you can use it for what you want to do with it. And um, 
it's a read only it's only to, it only reads it reads only um whatever you're putting into it you can't um change it or do anything to it and that really helps to um, keep the um, app safe but there's a way actually you can go about maybe um updating something in the uh, updating say a updating an input in the ui side and that is when you have these functions like uh, update update numeric input or update this this that or update this and you will see this um update um update and the shiny widgets um function you're interested in in many um in some other packages like say maybe a shiny mobile or dashboard a shiny dashboard plus or shiny dashboard there's always this update update and that's where maybe you want to do something with the input side with the um uh, you want to impute one of your let's say you want to sorry you want to um, change one of the imputes in the ui side and must be read in a reactive context so you have to use your render text or your reactive functions to actually be able to um, read it otherwise you get an error and the output is a list like object also it's used for sending output and this sends output to the um, the ui side and you always have to, you would always have to use a render function and set up a reactive context and render the HTML. And so this is just a basic example of what we're trying to explain. So uh, the fluid page is just the, let me say it's like the container for the web page. And we have this text impute. What this text impute is taking, okay, the name is the identifier. What is your name is the label. And this takes your name and also the text output. This text output is, Picking up whatever we pass into, it's picking up whatever is created in the server side and bringing it back to the UI side for the clients to see. Now, when you put in your name, the output comes up and say, okay, hello, then it mentions your name. So we have about two components in the UI side. On the server side, we have just um, the um, output greeting. But it contains it has the um it has your name or the name of the the client from the text input widget so in a way this um, relationship between the ui side and the server side is what is reactivity or is what is called um reactivity so that is the beginning of our talk today reactive programming reactive programming is an elegant and powerful programming paradigm but it can be disorienting at first because it's very it's a very different paradigm to writing a script. This is what Hadley can has to say about reactive programming. And so, in a way, we we're trying to like get these two sides to um to interact. And I remember when I initially started Shiny, and now I'm yet to even learn it more. I noticed something. Initially, I was just putting the input in the UI side, and I was thinking, okay, where would the output then be? Okay, where would the output be? Most times, I when I mean the output, I mean, let me go back to this so we can see it. I mean this, the greeting, the, this, this part that comes out with the greeting and say, okay, hello, hi, my name, hi, um, hi, maybe so, so, so. I was thinking, okay, is, is it gonna be on the server side? Well, interestingly, no, it's not gonna be on the server side. Whatever you are putting in the server side, you have to still make it known to the UI that, okay, this is where you're going to come out from. So that's why we have the text output. So the output widget actually takes in whatever you're trying to do in the server side, which may be linked to what you've gotten from the um, UI, I mean, the input widgets, then you'll be able to see, okay, this is what is, is going on in the Shiny app. So um, this takes us to the next stage. So the mental model via reactive programming, it's, tell, it's, it's between tell versus inform. Okay, Shiny, providing Shiny with recipe, not giving its commands. And this is where we come talk about imperative and declarative programming. So for imperative programming, you're issuing a command. I see imperative programming as you saying how, and the creative program as you saying what, if I'm to differentiate both in one word. So imperative programming is like, if I was to, um, sorry, if I was to um, describe um, each of them in one word, I would say imperative programming is saying how, and the creative programming is saying what. What in what sense? Or let me say how in what sense. Imperative programming is saying, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to do it. It's just a space command and it's carried out immediately. But for the creative programming, you have to like tell it what you want to do and you have to elucidate. My, sorry, I'm not interchanging them already. Yeah, no, no, I'm not. 
imperative programming is telling you, okay, this is how I want you to do, logically telling you, okay, this is how I want to achieve what you want to achieve, but what, this is what you achieve and this is how you're going to achieve it, like creating this, um, recipe of uh, impressive program saying make me a sandwich but the correct program is saying ensure there's a sandwich in the refrigerator whenever i look inside of it so each time i go to the refrigerator i want to find a sandwich there passive aggressive make me a sandwich assertive just get it done in essence you describe your overall goals and the software figures out how to achieve them without further invention okay so um laziness now this is another attribute of shiny interestingly um i was listening to one of the quotes video and it was like uh it would not say shiny is lazy it would only say maybe it's more like shiny's being um um efficient so what exactly is this laziness about shiny will not run if it feels something is wrong somewhere i won't tell you where that thing is wrong okay now that's just like a foggy explanation. So now let's get into it proper. Shiny aim is to only do the work that it is needed. That is needed, sorry. It will only update output that you can currently see. So for example, if we look at this app and ask ourselves, will this app work? Um, can anybody spot anything about this app? Anybody? You want to say something? If you use the chat session, I always check that too. Okay, so if you look at this part of the app, you would notice something is wrong there. And it's the, it's the, okay, someone just said something in the chat. It's actually the output section here that has the nick instead of nice. Let's see what this person is saying. Spelling, oh, beautiful, the spelling. And interestingly, if you run this app, Shiny won't tell you what's wrong. It won't. It will just run what it needs to run and leave the old thing that has an issue. So it will run this part of the code, but this other part, it won't run it. It will just leave it and it will tell you something is wrong. So maybe we should give that a try. You know, because this chapter is actually long, I want us to take so much time. And that brings us to. Okay, let me quickly run this code and so we could check. Let me just quickly create something. Oh, that would actually disrupt my workflow. Okay, we could actually do that because actually it would run, but it wouldn't just give it that last part of the code. So uh, if you're working on a shiny app and you just can't figure out why your code never gets run, double check and that your UI and server function are using the same identifiers. Okay, next part. But before we come here, the interesting thing is, should you not notice something? Should you notice something like, you want a certain output and you're getting it or you expect something to work and it didn't work the way you want it to work, then there's a way you could actually check the background and say, okay, what exactly is wrong with my shiny app? And that is going to bring us to um, the reactive graph. So the reactive graph makes it possible for us to understand the order of execution. Okay, after this, what's next? After this, what's next? What is linked to what and how is it linked to it? And the code is only run when needed. So the code will only run whenever it is what? Whenever it is, whenever it is needed. So how exactly does the reactive graph? We have the input, we have the reactive, and we have the output. So if we go back to the last example we had earlier on, it's text input name. So this actually is a basic shiny app saying, okay, it wants to take a name, and the place for that for that, or the ID for that will be name. And this is the label. What is your name? It takes in your name and goes to the server side and says, okay, we have the name of somebody and we want you to say hello in greeting. So there's a text output that says, hello, so-and-so. And the next text output should be, have a nice day, so-and-so. But because of this has an error, it won't run this. So there's a way, there's a way it links all together. So this input name is linked towards the greeting. And that's what we see here name is linked to greeting and this can be done in so many ways you can have your reactive graph done you can draw it with your hand you can use the diagram r package to make it manually yourself or if you just use the react log package that does it automatically and we'll come in talk more about that when we get to uh, some chapters later ch um, chapters after now 
And now we're going to talk about something else, the reactive expression. If you notice when we checked our reactive graph recently, or just the last slide, this is reactive. This could be a react, this could be a reactive expression. And it sounds like an intermediary between an input and an output. And how exactly does that work? Reactive expression kind of reduces the, um, the tendencies for duplication or you having to write something over and over again. And I, I think either in the R programming book by Garrett or the R4DS book, I think somewhere it is written that if you have to write a code three times, then possibly you just need to write a function. If it's not in either of those two books, possibly I read it somewhere else, maybe another book by, I have a strong premonition I did one of those two books. And, if we notice something about this particular, this server side, we have the server side saying there's an input output session and we have this string, this string, the string takes the reactive function and is meant to paste or say hello and mention the name of the person that has been put in the, um, the UI side. And output greeting when that's a string and the function. So, if we actually look at this, this actually is written um, step by step, but sometimes in, 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 in Shiny, it might not necessarily be in this order, but it's best when you write your code in the order of execution, that makes it easier to go through. But this expression of string makes it possible for me to reuse this expression as a function whenever I have to, without having to rewrite this whole thing all over again making it easier for me to um, go through it. If we check the textbook, which we are using, although this is more like the shorter version of it, we'll find out that there's a whole lot more on this. So currently we are this part of it, the reactive graph or reactive expression, sorry. We find out that the string function actually serve as the intermediary between the name and the greeting. Saying, okay, um, instead of me having, to, if I have to still use this string function, maybe as another output somewhere, I don't have to rewrite this whole thing again. I just have to use the, the string function, which is now a reactive. Okay, you should consider writing a function. Oh, beautiful, Trevin just checked. It's, an, it's the R4DS book. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that, Trevin. So um, reactive expression takes inputs and produce outputs. So they have a shape that combines features of both inputs and outputs. Hopefully the shape will help you remember how the components fit together. So in a way they try to make it easy for us like just understand this whole thing that, um, that is here because you can see that this shape fits in perfectly into this and this part fits in perfectly into this other part. So I mentioned something about the execution order earlier. I said irrespective of how the codes are written, as long as there's no error in your writing, you should, it should run or there's no spelling or grammar, um, spelling mistakes, it should run and you should get an output. And like I said, irrespective of the order, this would, this would still run. But let's quickly play with this exercises. So we just take one or two of them and we would move on. I would like us to um, say something, but if we are actually maybe super hooked on something else, no problem, but let's just um, do this together. So we have this UI with the fluid page, let's impute. I, I actually did this exercise and they were quite interesting. So um, fix the sample, simple errors on each of the three server functions below. So um, you can actually run this code and put this old thing in your um, Shiny app that you're building. And at the end, where you have to compile the old thing, like where you have your Shiny app into brackets, UI equals UI, server equals, you can now make it, different, you can say server one, in case maybe you want to copy the whole thing at the same time, you can make server one, run it, then get your answer, then put server two later on, run it, you get, it won't affect anything. Like that will make you see, okay, how lazy R could be. It will even touch the code that it does not, that doesn't concern, concern it. But if that is actually wrong, you can just tell me that, no, 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 that wouldn't work. And we would check it out and see if it will really work or not. Okay, so let's see what the first problem is for server one. And, um, Somebody else could quickly check server two, server three, and we can come up with the answers. So anybody saying something, I'm waiting. Who's saying something there? Anybody? It's supposed to be a discussion. Okay. 
Um, does the first one need an output? The first one needs an output. Okay. Yes, the first one needs an output because we have the text output here saying greeting. The first one needs an output. Oh, thank you so much, um, Trevin. But I have a quick question for us. I notice that sometimes whenever we have a reactive expression being used, we only have, we could sometimes have these, um, these brackets. But at some times we have these other brackets, the coily braces in the other, um, the other bracket I used, I mentioned in the, in the chat session. Uh, what's the, really the difference? Like, is there really any difference there or why is it so? Does anybody have an idea? And um, while we're thinking about that, we can just go ahead for server two and come up with the answer also. So for server two, we have the input output tab, greeting, paste, go, hello, input name, and what exactly is gonna happen here? How should we do this? What would be the answer? What is wrong? Anybody? Trevin said the first one. Okay. I think this time around we have um, greeting to be um, the object greeting to just have paste O and this is supposed to have the one of the render functions that is for the first line. Um, that is the area. So we can cover all we need to cover today. Um, I think this one has a spelling error. This has a spelling error. So I'll just move on. We could actually try drawing this reactive graph ourselves and um, come up with it. I uh, I think I was able to do something for do this with my pen and my notes. But you saying something, Trevin? Um, what was so? What was your question on the? Uh, curly brackets versus the parentheses is you're wondering why they were in some parts but not the other yeah yeah i was wondering why sometimes you use them for some reactive functions and some or expressions and sometimes uh, reactive functions precisely and sometimes you don't uh sometimes omit it and nothing happens and um I just wanted to see if anybody maybe has encountered, uh, since maybe due to your using Shiny, maybe you have a, an idea on why that is so and not, or why that's so. Okay, I let me take a look. But uh, you can you can continue if you want. Okay, no problem then. Uh, when you're just ready, just let me know. So why? Let's go to the next part. That's uh, number three, and uh, exercise three. Sorry, why would this code fail? Now, these two codes here will fail. They give us a hint already. Why are range and viva bad names for reactive? So, um, if you are part of the advanced R class or you've taken the advanced R, sorry, you've read the advanced R book, you would have an idea why these are bad names for reactive because chapter two of the advanced R book talks about um, the naming conventions in R because range and var are actually dedica dedicated names to some functions in R. You can use them as um, names for a reactive. It would affect many things or it would cause a lot of trouble or unnecessary problems. And um, so back to R, the, the reactive expression side. So we use reactive expression because we want to avoid duplicating um, or rewriting certain parts of our code. And um, like input, you can use the result of reactive expression in an output. And like output, reactive expression depends on input and automatically know when they need updating. That's all the um, reasons why um, reactive expression come in very, very handy. So the dual this duality means we need new vocab that producers and consumers. So I'll go back to the, um, the shorter version of the book, the, um, the book club um, version of the book and continue there. So producers and consumers. So these are new vocabs that are used because of the peculiarity of the inputs, the expression and the output. So in this way, we can actually understand how uh, um, our apps work 
by seeing what we are using as the input, the expression, and the, the output. So let's check the examples that are, are there that in, in this slide here. Uh, talked about the execution order already. And um, we have the output greeting, which is taking this um, reactive expression or the string function now, which is saying hello and input name. So this is like saying, if you input your name, it comes into string and comes out as the output, output greeting. So let's talk about constraint timing or evaluation. But before this, I think would be, I would need to go back to the text. There's, there's a part where the motivation behind this. Imagine once, okay. Know that the curly braces are only required in render function if you need to run multiple lines of code as you learn shortly. You should do as you need to computation. Okay. If you do computation in your render function as possible, well, which means you can often only them. Oh, beautiful. Oh, there's even a oh, okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, so I think it's just a matter of um how much how much code you have inside uh, okay 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 thank you for uh checking up that uh, i actually also still checked online trying to find out because but i just wanted to see and get to know more about about it and now i'm getting to get uh to understand another side of it i'll still read, read more to um to know why things are the way they are so um what's the motivation behind this uh i remember when i started shiny it was just about okay let's just find a way to communicate this data but then the, the workflow most times will have you wanting to test out several hypotheses like okay when i mean hypothesis so let's say you're trying to look into the data you've wrangled the data you've transformed it you've visualized it okay you've gotten some insights okay this is how i want my app to to look and um, you want maybe a backlot here, you want this there, you want that there, and you want to compare this or that and um, make it easy for whoever is um, using the app to say, okay, I want to check between the height, check the um, the, um, the relationship between the height and the weight. Okay, um, I want to see why this is this, or I want to just calculate the, um, the BMI of people or something. You have to first like build the whole thing somewhere or start writing our codes to like see how that is possible. Then before you come back to Shiny, then and make your um and create the input widgets to be able to specify or pick any of the variables in your data set. In that way, you kind of like make it easier for you to like put, progress from one side of the whole thing to the next next level. And we actually seen a shiny um a, a a shiny app that has been um, written or whoever wrote it has gone through that process already making it easier for us and that's what this all um, lines are saying like somebody has already done all the um, experimentation and came out with the functions that we need to get this done and we have the frequency polygon function and that function makes it possible for us to generate um, a frequency polygon after we have um, taken in about um, two different inputs, although the function has about the ag four arguments, sorry, four arguments. And um, we have another function, the t-test function, which takes two arguments, and these arguments are actually um, inputs in the Shiny app. Okay, so I think we can run the um, app. I think there's this. No, I think it's the first one. Okay, so it's this. Uh, let me reload. Come in. Please wait. Okay, good. So this is actually the app. Uh, this particular app here. Um, we have this um this functions written. And you might be asking why exactly do we have this library here? We have this library here because we will be using the function ggplot to plot the frequency polygon. And um, we have this plot already. And so with all this achieved by this one of the data analysts, 
or data scientist has come to a point where he wants to build his app now. So he's done with all this experimentation. Now he's about to build his app. And this is what the app looks like. Now, if you look at this app, we have a fluid page, which is the container, which is like a container for the um for the web app, or stating what the web app should look like. And we have the fluid row. The fluid row is like the um how like put it now, like the um horizontal compartment. And for this particular fluid page, we have about two of them. Two horizontal compartments that can house anything. Say your plot, it could house your um, um, widgets, it could house the house a whole lot. And a fluid rule has about has, has a length of about 12. And um you can break it into any 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 any, any um you could, you could break it into um segments segments depending on um what you plan on, on doing and that is one reason why i am amazed at the beauty behind shiny um shiny app development because when you look at it it's like you can you might you might have to sit down and pick up your your, your, your sketch pad and sketch what you want the web app to look like and that takes you from just being a data analyst to um coming up with a very beautiful product in the long run making you like a a, a product management or so a product manager or a, a product designer of some sort so if you look at this particular one, we have um, um, this um, function column, about three of them, and the first argument there says four. So this particular column here is taking a size of, it's taking a, a, size, a, a width of four, and three of them are taking four for each, making 12 for that particular um, field row. And we have different um, shiny widgets, shiny input widgets in each of the columns. And the last few row, you can see this is nine and three. We have the first column being a plot output and the last one being a verbatim text output. And these are shiny output widgets. So the first few row was more about the shiny input widget. And the last few row is more about the, the shiny output widget. And if you look at, and this is all in the UI side, and this is what it looks like here. So this is the first fluid row. This whole thing we're seeing here is the first fluid row. And this is the second fluid row. This second fluid row contains our outputs. The first output is our, um, our, our plot output. Then this, the other one, this is, this is taking nine. You can see this is nine, about nine. So this is four, 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 and this is nine, and this is three. So if this is four, You'd have seen it from the the design that the shape really um the the size is aligns with what is like I mean shows that okay this is nine and what up there what's up there is is four each and going back to this we we can now see what is really going on sorry let me take that slow. So if we make any change, there's an update, automatic update. Say we increase this by, by three. There's a change in the graph. Something happens. Whatever change we make happen, something changes in the graph. It reacts almost immediately. If we make any change, we get something immediately. And Okay, and the, the the reactive graph for that is is quite um um is, a, is kind of like congested. It has a whole lot. Um, every of the inputs is going to um combine to give us what the t test is is going to be, like most of it. Then for the histogram, we know the bin will to work with the histogram and not for t test. T test is more of a statistical test, and the histogram is more of a both output. And the bin width actually specify okay the um the width of each of the let me say the the bars on the um sorry the bin width actually represents how how um uh, I want to be sure I am um, okay this is it so the bin width represents how um 
I should say how wide the how wide the um the graph how like it now the bean widths in histogram is more like how wide each of the um the columns would be the bars in each of the um in the plot. Well, yeah, everything is like it's just modded up and it's not so clear. And at this point, we need to like make it possible to understand what each each of the um, inputs is doing and come up with something much more um, understandable. So if anybody is looking at it, one can be able to okay know what to do. And that is where it is advisable that if you have to make your code into a function, so what needs to be shiny stays shiny and what needs to be made into a function can operate as a function. And whoever is going through one's code, we'll be able to okay, see, oh, this code, okay, this is this function, this is what's doing, oh, this is reactive expression, okay, this is what's happening at this. And that makes it possible for us to like, like compartmentalize each of our code. And in, in turn, we are able to like understand or anybody looking through the code will be able to understand what is, what is, um, what is going on. So in the process of simplifying this graph, if you look at this point here, we have everything just, everything is together. And um, in a way there was repetition. This is X1 is um, um, normal distribution. Then we have this inputs, the input N1, number of observation, then the mean, then the standard deviation. We have about, uh, we have these two lines of code repeated again at this other side. And this repetition was for two different um, render functions, this render plots and render text. And we could have done that in a different way by just creating a reactive expression. And that's what was done at this point here. I'll show that here. At this point here, a reactive expression was created to house S1 and S2. Now, since it's housing X1 and X2, we're able to create that same plot again this time around with the shorter version of those um, code, making it easier for us to like go through it and reducing the um reducing the um, amount of the, the necessity to type that long or making it even easier for R to be efficient in running the code. Excuse me. Now if you, if you check here we see that this is written twice, but this time around it's shorter and it becomes this. X1 and X2 and we have that again here. Making it making it to even affect our graph, making our graph even easier to understand and comprehend. So it's like a win-win situation. When we go back to checking our, 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 our React graph, it's our reactive graph, it is easier to um, understand what's going on there. And when we look at the code itself, it's even in the, easier to understand what is also happening there. So we can see from this point that everything has like, there's a reactive expression now housing each of the, like um, a group of the inputs in question. And this, which is exactly for the histogram plot, is basically facing just the histogram plot. And we know, okay, this is coming back to um, t-test. This is to t-test, and this is also coming back to the histogram. And this is actually going to cause us to go into a part of um, shiny development, which is called um, modularization of code or writing, or um, yes, writing modules. And um, modules allow one to extract out repeated codes for reuse. Why guarantee that it is isolated from everything else in the app? Modules are an extreme, extremely useful and powerful techniques for complex, for more complex app. And um, if you see some very, very, very complex apps, you 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 be shocked about how much um, how much um, things are going on on the net. A scripts could be used be used for like the, the, the data manipulation aspect, and um, another script could um, just house maybe a function that um, allows you to um, um that will cause a certain reaction in the app itself and you you, you are you have, a complex app could, could have many layers maybe close to four or five and you could have a map somewhere you could have many things just going on at the same time and um and that's the beauty of it of, of shiny itself so um you might be familiar with the rule of three the rule of three of programming whenever you copy or paste something three times you should figure out how to reduce the equation simply by writing a a function but in Shiny, it's not the same. This time around, it has to just be once. It has to just be once so that um, it makes it um, easier for R to, to get things done. So they said the rule is stricter for Shiny because reactive expression don't just make it easy, easier for humans to understand the code. They also improve Shiny's ability to efficiently rerun the code. So we're back to the same thing which we've 
talked about earlier on, why do we need reactive expression? Uh, I, if we can, let's just do a brief recap based on what we've been discussing. Number one, it makes it um, it makes it, the app um, more efficient and reduce reduce um, redundancy. Yes. Uh, then, so um, why do we need reactive expression? Hope I'm not alone here. Hello. Are we still there? Sorry, a reaction will really help me now. So I know I'm not talking to myself. Okay. I'm I'm here. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Um there's another um aspect of this book that I'm really looking forward to. And this aspect talks about the um how one can like get to write beautiful functions in form of modules and um, get them to do some very um, interesting things. And even in the process of making these modules into packages that you can later um, reuse when building other shiny apps, I, I, I look forward to seeing how that can really be a reality in, in the course of like learning this, um, learning this material with, 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 with every one of us here. And um, I hope, I hope that will, would um, be a possibility. And um, and um, just this quick question that I've been thinking about, um, Trevin and, and Adit, and Adit, if I'm not pronouncing your name right, please just correct me. Um, is is it necessary to to have some background knowledge in say HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or let me just say front end development or back end development before one can really do exceptionally well as a shiny app developer? Anybody could answer. You could use the text box. You could use the chat um, area too. Um, uh, that's just a question for the for now. Then we'll go back into it. And I believe we're going to finish this whole thing today because we're almost done. Anybody um, asking I, that? I don't think it's necessary. I think you okay. can do a lot of things just using. Uh, shiny itself and r um but once you once you get a hold of it it can really help extend your what what shiny can do okay are okay, you saying um if one can actually um go ahead and then maybe html css like it could really help what one can do with shiny so if i get you right that was just... yeah i think okay. although i think maybe javascript Okay. Gives you okay. more. Gives you more uh, ability. Okay. 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 So um, at least that uh, makes me know I'm not alone here. So thank you for that wonderful answer, um, Trevin. So um, let's go straight back into the book and see how we can finish up what we started today. So um, why do we need reactive expression to reduce duplication? I said that earlier, and. If we let's check out this this part of the book, I kind of like what happened here. The um, experimentation is at the weekend did here, so um, he has this um, duplicated part of the. Okay, he um, sorry. Um, when you first start working with reactive code, you might wonder why we need reactive expression. Why can't you just use your existing tool for reducing duplication in code, like creating new variables and writing functions? Okay. He said, unfortunately, neither of these techniques works in a reactive environment. And he was trying to go for the Shunos example, why that wouldn't work. And um, the first one was he made them variables, like created new variables. And when he did that, he said um, there'll be an error, most likely an error will occur, or there will not be updates of the input. Oh, when is that? When? Okay, this is it here. When the session begins, not every time one of the op the one of the one of the inputs was updated. So, but if you try to use a function, the app will work. But this is not so 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 efficient because it calculates every time it is called. But if you use a reactive expression, it calculates the value only when it might might have changed, and that is why we have this. Um, if you notice what's going on here, we, we get to see the function. This function written as this. And um, Trevin, back to that question I asked earlier on, if you notice something here, 
um, the function was written in such that we don't have the coily braces. Like, you know, normally for this, okay, the server side is actually a function that has the parenthesis first. Then we have the coily braces that houses everything in the, um, in the server, server side. This and this. But this time around for function, it doesn't have that. Does that still apply? Yeah, I think that's because the function fits on one line. So okay. Okay. That that's okay. basically just aesthetics. Okay. 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 So um this is just a simple function. The the function was written, but this means it has to recalculate itself every time. And we know how beautiful R is with 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 RAM. It's it knows how to like consume RAM a lot, and that's will just keep your, your your R code running and taking a lot of time. And the best way to actually do this is to actually make it a, a reactive. And with that, you're able to run the the code faster and it's easier. And so controlling time of timing of evaluation. Controlling timing of evaluation. And this actually brings us to one part of Shiny that I'm so um, interested in understanding. How we can um, cause um, a reaction or a change in the app by clicking a button or causing something to happen somewhere. So I would um, go, like, just talk more about it now as we um, check this out. Um, Contrain timing of evaluation. We have this reactive graph, a simpler graph, a simpler app was actually written for this purpose. And then um, this particular app just has um, is a simulation app having this time around. It's a I think it's Python distribution. Yeah, it's Python distribution where we have the um, the lambda and also the um, the n given, and most times you can actually impute it. And I think I have that output here. I think this, no, this is for the events reactor. Sorry. I think this is it. Okay, good. So, okay, so whenever we change any of the imputes here something happens we get an automatic response like it was, the, the, the reactivity kicks in and <laughs> put it that way reactivity like kicks in and then we see the simulation in in progress and this is the reactive graph for that what's really going on um in the background and when we are to use a timed evaluation imagine you want to reinforce the fact that this is for simulated data by constantly re simulating data that you see an animation rather than static plots. We can increase the frequency of the updates using a new function, reactive timer. So there are functions can actually do to like um, um, um time the um time the process, time the process of like of evaluation. And for this particular part, you want the um, reactive expression to invalidate itself more than it otherwise would. For example, the following code uses an interval of 500 milliseconds. And this is fast enough to remind you that you're looking at the simulation without dizzying you with rapid changes. So in case we have to do something and we have different processes running simultaneously or running as, as we are uh, making changes, um, we are changing this, something is happening here, we're changing that, we're changing the other parts and we're getting feedbacks. How can we manage all this at the same time? How can we watch all this at the same time and not get totally confused? There's actually a way to go about that. And that's where we have to like put a timer. And this time actually makes it possible for us to like, um, um, to call, but not like, it makes it possible for us to like, um, take out the inputs, like determine when the input would run and give an output. Okay, let me see how I can explain that because this part was kind of a bit tricky for me when I was going through the book. And um, in the above scenario, think about what will happen if the simulation code took one second to run. 
We perform the simulation every 0.5 seconds. So Shiny would have more and more to do and would never be able to catch up. The same problem can happen if someone is rapidly clicking buttons in your app and the competition you're doing is relatively expensive. It's, pos it's possible to create a big backlog of work for Shiny. And while it's working on the backlog, it, can respond to, it can't respond to any new event. This leads to poor user experience. And one of the things about um, Complex Shiny app is that um, you want to ensure that whoever is using that Complex Shiny app is having the best of his, his or time. Uh, I think we have about three more minutes on the clock. And I know we might want to go and watch the um, current um, football matches in World Cup, in World Cup um, games. So I'll see how we can round up this as soon as possible. And if this situation arises in your app, you might want to require the user, use, the user to opt in to perform the expense calculation by requiring them to click a button. And this is, great, this is a great use case for an action button, uh, the action button function. So the action button creates like, create a scenario where you can just click on a button and it determines when exactly you get, um, you get the feedback from the app. And this is what one of the, um, this is what um, the app looks like when we have this, the simulate button embedded in the app. So this is what it looks like. So should I make a change? This is how it works. It's like you get something, something happens when you click the simulate button. And how do we bring it into the server side? When we have the action button saying simulate, how do we bring it to the, um, the server side? We would do that by writing a code that says, um, using event reactive. We do that using uh, event reactive. I think this is that part where, okay, yes. Event reactive is a function where you put a uh, input. Since it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a shiny input widget, say input simulates then this. So whatever you do at this point in time, at this point, you get like a feedback automatically. And it's kind of like reduces the, 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 the chances of, of you not getting um of you not getting a backlog, it uses the chances like you're able to see what you're running and gives you what's okay. I need to head out. Okay, thanks, that might be okay, okay, okay. Trevin needs to go. Okay, so we're almost done. Oh, no problem, Trevin. So how does the observer um button work? The observe button like creates um makes it possible for you to like um do something outside the app without um disrupting the 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 you can do anything you want to do, like maybe you want to perform an action outside the application, like you want to um, update a database. It's that's the observe um, events of the observers or the observer functions make that really, really possible. And that's where you have the um, observe events, you put your input name and it gets you a message. And the observe event actually prints out its messages in the console area. And then you're able to like get your, um, your feedback on what exactly is going on. So it's like a very good debugging tool to answer maybe any um, question you want to, anything going on that you're not so clear about. And you don't assign, like the difference between an observe event and events reactive is like, you don't, you don't assign the result of observe event to a variable and you can't refer to it from other reactive, um, reactive con consumers. So the observe event actually prints out the message on the console area, then you're able to understand, okay, this is what is going on here and you get, get out to like resolve that challenge or, Whatever comes out there. So at this point, I think we're able to go over chapter three, and um, we already this is already eight, and tomorrow we would be so eight my own time. Tomorrow would be um said say tomorrow. Sorry, next week we'll be checking chapter checking chapter three and chapter four. Sorry, and that's a case study where we are going to put all we'll look at in chapter one, two, three into a a case study and um, do something amazing with with that. So um, if we don't get any volunteer for that, I'll be the one taking that and um, that will be next week. And I look forward to um, having us um, around next week. So I want to say thank you guys for joining today's meeting and um, today's discussion, sorry. Um, so it's quite fun having you guys around and I hope to see you guys again next time. And um, you can also check videos from other people. I wish I, from other court, past court, I wish I did something much more better than this to have gotten our attention. Uh, I want to say thank you.
And um, at this point, we would be ending today's discussion and hope and um, by next week, we'll be talking talking about the case study ER injuries. And um, if there's nobody volunteering for that, I would take that also. And I look forward to having another session and another meeting and discussion with you guys. Thank you so much for your time. Um, okay, Aditi. Aditi, so I would be ending the meeting now. Um, I don't know if you're there, you want to say something, you can go ahead and say something. So I think there was no questions, there was nothing. Or do you have any question, Aditi, or is everything just clear? Or you want to say something before I end the call? Hello. Okay, so um, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful um, day, evening, from whatever part of the world you join the call from. Thank you, and bye.